Have you always wanted to do an influencer marketing program, but you're a small business and you don't have a lot of money to spend and you're wondering, is influencer marketing right for me? I'm even a tailor. I'm the publisher of DIYMarketers.com and the host of Visapalooza Chat. Today, we're going to show you how to run an influencer program on a budget. talking to Michaela Underall. She's the backbone behind Nimble.com. She's behind the scenes building that brand and its influencer program on a teeny tiny budget. Welcome, Michaela. It's so great to have Hi. you here. Thank you so much, Here, It's fun to be here with my Slavic sister. That's and right. <laughs> Hashtag Slavic <laughs> sisters. I, you know, Michaela, I have had uh, John Ferrara, on this show mm -hmm. two or three times. When he came up with Nimble, he kept reaching out to a variety of people and not just celebrities to <laughs> introduce his tool. So I know that he built that brand on a budget, but of course, once the company got bigger and bigger, he continues to spend very little money on what I would call push marketing. It's a lot of relationship and pull marketing. And you are the woman behind that. And that's why I wanted to speak with you, Michaela. So talk a little bit about your history with Nimble because you are mm -hmm. actually doing exactly what John was doing. Yeah. Exactly. I start, I actually just celebrated my four year Nimbleversary <laughs> last week. So I have been with the company for four years. And like you said, John uh, is a big believer in influencer marketing and word of mouth marketing. Uh, that's how he built his previous company. You also mentioned Goldmine. So he knows it works, which is a really big advantage that I had compared to maybe other social media managers or marketers that belief in influencer marketing in the power of it but they don't have the buy-in from their management so i didn't i never had to deal with this problem because the ceo and the founder of the company has always been the person pushing it fighting for it and he taught me everything so like you said um yeah we we are still not spending a lot of money on marketing and advertising we are focusing on relationship building and identifying um, people that influence the decisions of our buyers and prospective buyers. And we not only focus on influencers, like in the traditional sense, like you would think maybe social media influencers, they are one group we focus on, but we also focus on analysts, bloggers, uh, journalists. So all kinds of press people that write about technology, small business like you, <laughs> Um, so these are all the different groups that we focus on and we spend a lot of time on identifying them, building the relationships with them, nurturing the relationships. And when the time is right, making the ask or working with them on some co-promotions and collaborations. Well, you've just done a fantastic summary of what we're going to talk about today and talk a little bit about how you set that strategy up. So you know you want to do influencer marketing. Yeah. That's a big step. Well, now what? Yeah. And you just said something very important. It takes time. Before anybody dives into influencer marketing, they have to realize it takes time. It's like making friends. You can't just walk to somebody and ask them to do something for you. You can't just send somebody a LinkedIn invitation and pitch them. Well, I mean, you can, but you won't be successful. So realizing the fact that it will take time because it's building relationships uh, is the first step. So once you have that, <laughs> uh, then um, the Next thing you have to figure out is where you want to look. What are the areas that uh, will benefit? Um, like where, what are the areas around the promise of your product? So in our case, uh, we wrote down areas like sales, social selling, marketing, technology, small business. And that was like the first step to um, knowing where to look for the influencers. So once we had that, we also created another list with some of the keywords and the hashtags that we would wanna search. And 
we are not using any fancy tools. So this is literally how you can do this on the budget almost for free if you don't, don't count your time. So you can work with spreadsheets. You can uh, sign up for a tool like Hootsuite, which is that there is a free version or there's a paid version, which is not very expensive at all. And you can start tracking the conversations. And as you do that, people will start coming up. You'll start seeing people that blog about it, blog about it, talk about it, the people that uh, are passionate about it. So once you start seeing them, you should be noting them somewhere. In our case, we use our own software. We have a browser extension that allows you just hover over the name, bring them into the database, we tag them, and basically put them on the nurture track. So we engage with them, start following them on Twitter, connect with them on LinkedIn, and as the relationship progresses, we connect with them on multiple other social platforms. And always, we're always on the lookout for engagement opportunities and opportunities to help them. Because it's, again, like being friends with somebody. You're friends with them on Facebook, they share something, they need a restaurant recommendation. Well, if it's a journalist, he or she might be looking for quotes or something. So that's where you can come in. Maybe it won't even be you helping them, but it doesn't matter, you'll help them. That's, that should be your intention anyway. So you can introduce them to somebody who might have the answers. Um, so you can, you can just do the searches manually or keep the list of people that you want to continue to develop and nurture relationships with in a spreadsheet or your CRM. And then you should always have a goal for everybody. So what is the, where are you going with them? Do you want them to write about you or do you want to do a webinar with them or what is it? So that's always good to know because they will help you to be successful. If you're not quite sure what the other terms or hashtags might be, start with the area you identify. So maybe you're in sales or social selling would be the area. Then once you start running the searches and you can even start running the search on Twitter and you, can, uh, you should be paying attention to the other hashtags and keywords that people are using. So you end up on, on a post that is hashtag sales Chances are somebody will also hashtag it social sales or B2B sales. So this is what I meant by the hashtags. Just make, we did it because we wanted to um, start using them as well. So whatever we share show up, shows up in these conversations as well. But it also helps us to kind of expand and look for people that might not be using hashtag sales because it's pretty broad. But using the hashtag, hashtag B2B sales because that's more specific to our product. So it's even better. How did you on these different platforms uh, watch and track for opportunities to engage? That's question one. How did you like manage that? Mm -hmm. Question number two that's related to that is how did you open up the conversation? Because I think people really struggle with sort of what to say. <laughs> yes. They do. So to question one, um, yes, you have to do some kind of qualification. Ideally, you do it before you even add them to the list. Um, and like you said, looking at the number of followers, that's not a really good indicator. It's an indicator, but you shouldn't be judging people based on how many followers they have. Um, good example of why you shouldn't. I've, I don't even know... <laughs> how many Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook posts I have seen in the four years. Um, everybody knows that you can buy followers. So you can just, just don't look at just that. So um, great way is to go through the person's, uh, whatever platform you land on first, go through their social feed, see what they're talking about. Maybe they're linking to a different platform. Maybe the platform you're on is not their primary platform. Maybe they're, they're active more on Facebook. So they'll, they'll usually be sharing the link to Facebook, kind of letting people, guiding people where they want them. Um, and yeah, we look on um, what they share, what they talk about, how, where they publish, if they, pub, if they contribute to any publications, um, are they good writers? <laughs> Do they have good analytical skills? Can they, are they really the right fit for us? Um, and also uh, we look, at the engagement are they just 
broadcasting or do they have people actually engaging with whatever they're sharing, writing about? And if they do, then obviously they are a great fit and they don't need to have 40, 100,000 followers. They can have an amazing community of few hundred or few thousand and you develop a relationship with somebody like that and getting them to write about you and spreading the word about your brand um, can actually bring you more results than trying to build a relationship with a superstar that's just talking about themselves and people don't really, people tune out after a while if you just blah, blah about yourself. They don't care. <laughs> give, before we leave question number one, give folks a quick tip on how to tell that a person is engaging actively on this platform. On the first look, it can, it can look like they are active, but then when you spend a little more time looking at it, you and clicking on the links, you'll see if they're actually adding some value to the article they're sharing. Are they adding their own thoughts? Do they have people asking them questions? And if so, are they responding to them or they care just about sharing stuff and likes? Um, so all these things. And you'll start seeing people um, that share videos and podcasts and then they they say okay so this person on this podcast talk about this this is an amazing uh amazing point i do i do it like this so that would be uh the right person the person that engages that actually cares and does the content curation creation right great so let's go speaking of which great segue into question number two you know, when we want to make friends with someone and you really want to be friends with someone, but they don't know who you are, <laughs> it can, you can kind of feel like, I don't know what to say. Yeah, exactly. And, and I have to admit that I feel that way. I'm not naturally witty. I'm not naturally funny. Some people say things I see like on my chat and I'm like, dang, that was smart. <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, yeah. Yeah, I never know what to say. I don't consider myself to be like super funny or anything like that either. So it takes some creativity and time and you, again, start small baby steps. It takes time. So it's okay to spend some time trying to figure out what to say or what to like. Worst thing you could do is just say something stupid or like something you don't understand. Like if you comment on an article, you have no idea that's about then it will probably have the right effect. So keep an eye on whatever they're sharing. And if there's something that you could add some value to, do it. And you could, you could just start liking and people, um, after time they start recognizing your name and then you can just comment on it. And if, of course, if you have something to say <laughs> about it. So uh, chances are, if you're looking for the right influencers in your area of expertise or around the promise of your brand product, um, then you should have something to say about it. Like how many of these relationships can you really manage? Good question. Good point. So uh, the Dunbar limit tells us that we can't manage more than 100 or 150, whatever the uh, number is, relationships. So I, at the beginning, I mentioned spreadsheets. They're great. Um, that certainly help with keeping the information in, in your head, uh, but that's why we use CRM, or that's why John developed the product. So it can help you store the information about all these important people, and not only store the information, but then telling the software to ping you when, is it, when it's time to follow up with them. So if you really want to scale influencer marketing, then you have to manage more than 100. But you can do it. It can be just you and it can be just you and the spreadsheet. You, you probably will need some help, like get in a CRM database that can do the nudges for you. I'm not talking about automating the process because they're relationships and they need the manual human touch, but they can help you in rem reminding you it's time to follow up or once you promise somebody something, you should note it there and schedule a reminder for the CRM to nudge you that it's time to do it. When you're asking influencers to create content for you, what kind of real value matters to the influencer? 
what you trade, how you trade, yeah. you know, that type of thing. Yes. So going back to how we develop the relationships. So once we, once people get familiar with our names and we've engaged several times and we feel like the time is right, we always try to do one-on-ones with them. We get, get them on Skype or Zoom, turn the camera on and we get interested in them. We ask them how we may help them. And people love talking about themselves and what they're passionate about. So they'll tell you. So maybe uh, we won't pay them for the content, but we can help them in something that might be even more valuable for them. Maybe we can make some introductions or we can do a webinar with them and really promote them to our audience. So we're always looking for a way that would work for both of us. We also give our product to many of them for a discounted price or even for free. So if it's something that can save them hours, they're already saving, saving money because they're saving time and time's more, you know, that that's the most important thing we have. So if you don't have the budget to pay, uh, you have to be creative and a great way to be creative is just to listen, ask them, what is it? How can I help you? What are you struggling with? Can I do something for you? Talk about the goal setting from Nimble's perspective as a business and then how that translated to what you want from particular influencers, how they can help you. Yeah, so it's part of the research. So if we come across somebody that is an amazing writer and they contribute to Forbes, that would be the goal for this specific person. Ideally, we want them to write about us in Forbes. Uh, another influencer might be an amazing storyteller with amazingly engaged audience. So we would want to do a webinar with them. So it really depends on, that's why you need to do the research and figure out what is it they're best at. Worst thing you can do is to do something that doesn't make sense for anybody. What about getting help? Give people some pointers on what is it that they should be doing themselves and what is it that they can then start handing off and what does that process look like and you know what should you be looking for i started slowly of course <laughs> when i started i wasn't really even familiar with social media and how all this thing works so it took time but john did want me to jump right in but it, there was a learning curve and he of course uh, had to make sure that i knew how to approach it he started making introductions with the people that he was already like really good friends with. So he would introduce me, introduce my role and basically tell them he, she's gonna be the point of contact from now on. Um, and yeah, so I think when somebody's looking for somebody uh, to help them with this, they need to look for somebody with really good social skills, somebody who's, uh, who for like a person who you seem like somebody who would not have problems um starting conversations and you you find that out during an interview is it somebody you would want to have a beer with or like what would you talk about if we if you went to lunch would it be awkward then maybe it's not the right person for this but if it's somebody you just like you know, you start and you can't stop. Like every time we get on a phone call together, it's like two hours. I'm like, ah, <laughs> I want to talk to you, but I also have work to do. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So looking for somebody with great social skills and then uh, also making sure that you uh, show them the process and explain them that it does take time, that they, they need to understand that even though you will give them some, some goals, like how many, I don't know, run items they have to secure, uh, you have to let them know that it, it is the main goal, but if they feel like the time is not right or they, would, or they get in some pushback from the people, the relationship is always the most important thing. So we might not hit the run item quota, but it's much better than ruining a relationship with amazing person and influencer. Mm, great point. Now, did John have a process written out or was it more of on the job training? Like you sat with him, you watched him. How did that work? Yeah. John is a visionary, but he is not a, the person that would write 
a process down. <laughs> so everything's in his head. So it was just basically him showing me things on his computer, explaining he, he loves his walks and talks. So we spent a lot of time walking in Santa Monica and him explaining the process. And then um, once I got it down, we started developing some, uh, uh, some internal documents because we have, and that's, I think might be a good tip for other people that want to do this on the budget as well. We have been using interns. Um, they, we always make sure that they can get a college credit for their time spent at Nimble. And we also make sure that we spend enough time with them uh, on talking to them what they want to accomplish from their internship and make sure that they learn as much as they can. We make sure that we spend enough time showing them how it actually works and then they get their hands on something. They, they, they actually learn something. That they, they don't just do data entry, which sometimes you need, but um, you actually teach them something and then they're more than happy to jump on, on anything. So we've been using the internal processes to train other hands and we've been using interns and it's been working great for us. When you have interns, how often, how long do they typically stay and how does that work? Like, are you able to teach them fast enough and then they're gone? Yes, that is a really good point. Our interns usually stay, um, it, it really depends. We've had many over the years, I would say usually three months. Uh, but since we already have the process down, we can teach them uh, pretty quickly. And they start with content creation and curation. And since we already have a lot of documents for them, they can always look at. It's much faster, but there is still the problem that they do end up leaving and then you have to do it again. But it's not been too big of a problem. You can get over it. Once you have the processes, then every time you teach somebody, it's, it's faster and faster. A lot of our audience are either main street business owners. As I mentioned, they could be accountants, lawyers, hairstylists, restaurant owners, people like that. Or like in the real estate business, for example. So they're on LinkedIn, they're on Facebook, and they want to leverage these influencer relationships. Uh, but if they're not online, what are, you know, what are your tips for finding influencers, you know, you're, you have to go through this research process that we've talked about. Yeah. It maybe you have some um, customers, clients, people who are in that space and they're using Nimble very effectively for that reason. Do you have anything to share? Um, yeah. So you mentioned um, people in real estate or uh, like hairstylists and I have actually been seeing more and more real estate people working on their, actively working on their personal brands and hairstylists, how many beauty bloggers and YouTubers there are. So it will be a different platform than we use. We're mostly uh, leveraging LinkedIn and Twitter, but it also depends on what space you're in. So if you're, if you're a hairdresser, or you, have, you have a salon, then you would probably probably be looking at different platforms, more visual platforms like Instagram, Pinterest, YouTube, just running the searches, Googling things, and you start discovering them. With, uh, with real estate, it will probably be LinkedIn and Twitter, but they're there. It might, like you said, it might be a little more difficult uh, than in our space, but I think more and more people are realizing the power of personal branding. So there's more and more people already. What's been the most exciting thing that you feel has resulted? Like what wonderful thing has happened to Nimble as a result of the work that you and John have done in influencer marketing? We have been accepted in a Microsoft Accelerator and uh, we have signed multiple uh, agreements. So Microsoft's actually reselling Nimble uh, through their resellers uh, right now. And that was something that John accomplished that that was the deal he basically secured through his network, uh, networking efforts through some Microsoft influencers. So that's another great example. Yeah. So, I, so let's kind of, you and I, summarize together for our listeners. What have we learned so far? All right. So 
let's say you're starting, you've never done this before. Um, what space are you in? Are you in B2C or B, B2B? Then uh, look at some of the social media platforms that are better for your space. So I already mentioned that in B2C, it might be more visual platforms like Instagram, Pinterest, look, look on YouTube. For B2B, people will probably be, they should be on LinkedIn for sure. They'll probably be on Twitter. They might be building their personal brands on Facebook. Uh, so I will start looking there. Also write down uh, all the areas that you want to start looking for people. So for us, it's sales, social selling, marketing, technology, small business, and start searching these terms. So you can use the search on the uh, social platform of your choice and pay attention to the hashtags. So when, when you find a great person, look at what are the hashtags that this person uses and also who are the people this person this influencer is influenced by look who they follow uh, when you're on twitter look on twitter lists what are the twitter lists they curated because people hang out with people like them so who are the people they these people talk to who are the people they put on lists or if you run across like an influencer list, who are all the other people that uh, somebody included on the list with this person? Then keep the list somewhere. Like I mentioned, we keep it in Nimble. And then the advantage is that you can also tag them and the whole team can easily find the tag. You can also create custom fields and qualify these people. Like uh, you mentioned, Ivana, that maybe you would even rank them like tier one, <laughs> tier two, whatever. Um, what, are the, what are their platforms? Where are they active? So um, once you get help from an intern or if you hire somebody, um, there needs to be a place where they can go and easily find all this information so they don't have to do the research again. Another ad advantage why we uh, of Nimble and why we use it internally is that uh, once you connect your Gmail or your Outlook, the history of communication with the person will be stored under their contact record. So that's another great reason why to keep it uh, in, the, in the tool and not just in the spreadsheet, because you need the context and the insights into the relationship. And once you have them somewhere, uh, start walking in their digital footprint and start paying attention to what they're saying and look for engagement opportunities and opportunities to help. Do they have a webinar? If so, can you share it? Can you tell your community about this awesome webinar? Do they have a book coming out? Well, spend a few dollars and buy it, get the Kindle version or <laughs> I don't know, uh, and review it on your blog. You might not help them sell thousands of books, but you'll help them spread the word. And over time, they'll start, uh, they'll start, um, noticing your name, they'll probably thank you, which is a great way to con continue the conversation. Maybe ask them to get on the phone call to learn more about each other and ask them what are other things that you can help them with. And most people appreciate your help and they'll feel the need to reciprocate. And they will. And it makes us all feel good when we help somebody. So, and just do it over time. Like I said, um, set up reminders, uh, find a tool that can remind you to, uh, check on these people periodically and just, you know, you don't have to touch them every day, not even every week, but periodically. And as you, as you build your list, you can do a little bit of this every day and touch few people here and there. Well, I think that is outstanding. I hope you guys took great notes. If you didn't, you're going to have to watch this again. I want to thank Michaela Underdahl from Nimble, the woman who makes it all happen. Thank you, Michaela. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Ivana. And I hope this has been helpful. If anybody has any questions, they can find me at Michaela at Nimble.com. Brilliant. So join us this week and every week on Bizapalooza Chat, Mondays, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And we'll see you then.